Welcome to Your Strata Property, the podcast for property owners looking for reliable, accurate and bite-sized information from an experienced and authoritative source. Hello and welcome to this week's podcast episode. I'm your host, Amanda Farmer, and this week I'm bringing you Joseph Arena of Arena Energy Consulting. This is an edited version of my live chat I had with Joseph over on the Your Strata Property Facebook page a couple of weeks ago. I invited Joseph to chat with me on Friday Live to ask him some burning questions about embedded networks, a topic that I was particularly interested in learning more about. And judging from the amount of views we've had on that video, both live and on the replay, turns out a lot of you were interested in learning about embedded networks as well. Now, if you didn't catch the chat live or you haven't seen the replay yet over on the Facebook page, I have a link in the show notes here to this episode where you can head straight over to Facebook and check that out. Friday Live is something that I do every couple of weeks over on the Facebook page. I started it off just over a year ago now when we all went into our first lockdown at the start of the pandemic here. And I thought our strata owners, strata managers, committee members might need a little something special on their Friday afternoon, a recap of the week that had been in Strata, particularly challenging weeks they were at that stage. But guess what? Not much has changed. We are still experiencing what's a challenge in the world of community living, even though we are very lucky to be able to say that the peak of the pandemic seems to be behind us for now. So Friday Live is something I have kept up and I am over on Facebook also going out to LinkedIn now. Each fortnightly Friday at about four o'clock Australian Eastern Time, if you are on my email list and you get regular emails updating you on what's happening on the podcast and in the Your Strata Property community, then you will get a reminder each fortnight about Friday Live. If you're not on that list and not getting your Friday Live reminders, just send an email to amanda at yourstrataproperty.com.au and we'll get that sorted for you. Now, my chat with Joseph Arena, you'll notice that the audio from that chat is a little different to my usual. I wasn't on my usual mic in my usual location. I was sitting in a rather empty room with a busy puppy dog nosing around at my feet. You'll hear Louis make a couple of cameos there but I'm sure that won't detract from the very important information Joseph is bringing us about embedded networks. Joseph is the managing director and owner of Arena Energy Consulting. He has over 21 years of experience in the Australian energy sector. His expertise covering advisory services, energy procurement, energy retailing, network distribution, smart metering, retail and residential embedded networks. His clients including commercial and industrial buildings, government, property and strata. He has recently been appointed as a council member of the Energy Charter's National Customer Code for Energy Brokers, Consultants and Retailers. Straight up, I asked Joseph to explain what exactly is an embedded network. Does it mean that residents can't choose their own energy suppliers? What happens if a resident feels that they're stuck with a bad deal? Can they get out of it? And a question that I didn't get a chance to ask Joseph live, but I have brought him back on the show to make sure we get the answer. Can buildings retrofit an embedded network? And if they want to, what are the steps they need to take? Now, I didn't get to ask Joseph that question live, but you will hear it separately recorded and added on to the end of our live chat. So if you want to know the answer to that one, hang in there as we wrap up our live chat and you'll hear that one added on. My special thanks to Joseph for chatting with me again last week to make sure we covered off that important topic of retrofitting. I shall take you over now to my chat with Joseph Arena. Joseph Arena, welcome to Friday Live. I was smiling at the lovely warm welcome. Thank you for that. <laughs> and thank you for the opportunity to, to chat with everybody today. It's great. 
You are most welcome to be here and I can tell by how many people are tuning in live how interested they are to hear more from you. We get lots and lots of visitors to our replay, so hello to those visitors who are watching the replay, but lots of people here live to learn more about embedded networks. So, Joseph, take it away. What exactly is an embedded network? Okay, so I'll, I'll jump straight into this. The Australian regulator's definition, but I, I don't think I'll go down that path. That's a little bit more technical and complex. So basically, it's an aggregation of all the energy that's used in a particular building and a building like a residential apartment block or a retirement village or a shopping center, something like that. So the power is aggregated to a central point, which is known as the parent meter, that the energy is unsold to the residents, the residential building downstream of that. So all the residential apartments are all metered as well, and that's in a nutshell what an embedded network is. It's a private electricity network. It's not the electricity distributors uh, network. So that's it. Okay, so I'm done now. Thank you for that. <laughs> <laughs> See ya. <laughs> now these are networks that, as I understood it, are these days in new buildings often put in place by a developer, is that right? Absolutely, yeah. So you mentioned all the strata laws before, you know, how complex it is. Exactly the same in the energy industry as well. It's very, very complex. And different state jurisdictions have different rules and regulations as well, not only from a strata perspective, but also from an energy um, perspective as well. So in Victoria, for example, embedded networks have been around 15 plus years in the current sort of style they are now. But if, if you even consider the most fundamental aspect of an embedded network, like a caravan park, you know, when we were kids, you know, going out to caravan parks, you're putting electricity either in a meter or you might pay for it included or not included. Those sort of scenarios are embedded networks as well. But just to go a little tiny bit technical for a second, in 2013, the Australian Energy Regulator published some new guidelines and it's a framework uh, it's called the National Energy Customer Framework that basically created a bit of crystallisation about the rules and regulations about embedded networks. So from that point, especially New South Wales, it has exponentially increased the number of embedded networks that are now created. They are generally found in larger buildings, 50 lots and above. Um, when I first started in the embedded network space, we were looking at really 100 lots and above, um, but it's that number sort of come down now, especially once people are now starting to aggregate uh, centralised hot water as well, which yeah. in theory is not an embedded network because that's, that's a definition under the rules and the regulations, but it's it's sort of an embedded network in, in that same sort of sense. So, so that was a long answer to your question. Yes, it's in a lot of buildings now. And why would a developer of a large or larger building decide to put in place an embedded network and not do it the old okay, so, way, not the way? Yeah, no, no, it's a good question. Lots of reasons. So one of the fundamental reasons is it makes the whole setup easier. So if you think you've got a, a building with 100 lots in it, you know, there'd be 100 electricity metres that need to be installed. There'd be one area for the common property as well. So that developer or the, the builder of the developer would have to have effectively 101 relationships with a local energy distributor. So, you know, Sydney metropolitan area, it's Osgrid, for example. So it's a 100 relationships, it's 100 metres, it's 100 electricity accounts that need to be set up. It's 100, 100, 100, you know, truck visits, etc. So when it's an embedded network, as I mentioned, it's aggregated to that, the central point, that parent meter. So it's only one connection point to the grid. So that relationship that needs to be established with the electricity network is one, not 101. And of course, when you have an embedded network manager involved as well, they'll help the developer to do that, to do that sort of setup. So that's one of the the first fundamental reasons why. So I can see about to ask another question. There's many more reasons as well, but um, but I'll, I'll stop at that for a second and take a breath. So. Well, that makes absolute sense to me. Uh, it is cheaper for the developer, I suppose, is the short story to yeah. have one of these embedded networks in place and perhaps it costs them nothing if they have somebody, a consultant, I'm not sure the word that you used, they're helping them set this up. Yeah. So it saves them a lot of money, but also the in many cases the embed network operator or the manager will also contribute funds towards the site in centralised hot water. They're actually paying for the hot water plant. There's a few different models, but you know, there's a model where they'll play for that hot water plant, the hot water meters, et cetera, which would traditionally have been paid for by the developer. Uh, the introduction of solar into a building or perhaps electric vehicle infrastructure charging, you know, those sort of assets can be funded by the embed network operator as well. 
And there have been some practices in the past where you know, money might have changed hands you know, for the right for managing the embedded network, or at least in New South Wales, obviously, you have to have the first AGM for the formal engagement. But the Australian Energy Regulator has come down on that. In 2018, they put forward some rules around payments to developers. So it's a sort of pretty very controversial topic to start going down that rabbit hole now. Hey, um, that's what we um, do but, here, Joseph. Well, there you go. So um, <laughs> we have um, people responding to that, uh, the uh, polarised um, responses from developers and bed network operators on one end uh, up through to the other. But yeah. it's not all It's not all bad news. I mean, there's, I've dealt with plenty of developers in the past and so they want as many benefits as possible to go to you know, to the occupants of the building. So whether that's the owner's corporation entity itself or, or the residents within the building, um, it's okay. really a lot of it's got to do with the mindset of the developer at, at the beginning. I do want to get into that. You've mentioned there, though, the first AGM, and I just want to get an idea of how it plays out when we have, a, you say we're a new owner, maybe we've bought off the plan, the plan's come off now and we've settled, we're the proud owners of a new apartment building, there is an embedded network in this building. We're going to the first AGM. What's happening at the first AGM in relation yeah. to the embedded network? Sure. Okay, no, that's great. I'll, I'll give you two different scenarios. So let's go to Victoria first. So in Victoria, the IGM, the inaugural general meeting, the developer would sign a 10-year contract with the embedded network manager, traditionally, that's been happening in the past. Then at the first AGM, that agreement is then novated across to the owners' corporation. So they rock up. There's like a nine and a half years or, or whatever left on this 10-year agreement, and it is what it is, full stop. Mm. So in New South Wales, the dynamics are slightly different. Of course, no agreements um, can be entered into prior to the first AGM for, for longevity. So you have a scenario where the embed network operator might attend the first AGM. They're presenting their agreements to the occupants there, obviously the, the soon to be you know, former owners corporation. They have a 30 or 40 or 50 or 70 page document that they're going through with um, 25 different motions or 40 different motions. So it's 9.30 or 10 o'clock at night. They come up to you know, motion number 28 electricity embedded network, and then they go through the motions, vote yes, no. So these these are the scenarios that are occurring and it certainly raises a level of anxiety for some customers if they don't understand what's going on. So we mentioned before about seeking advice, that fellow Ben or whoever that was, mm. uh, who mentioned about, you know, someone mentioned about getting external advice, you know, self-serving, of course, <laughs> that's what I do. But, you know, if people are concerned about it or they just they don't know anything about it at all, it's an opportunity to actually take a breath and stop. Mm. You know, there's been scenarios where the document gets passed, the motion gets passed, bang, it happens. It's in five years, ten years, whatever it might be. You know, a, a management agreement is put in place. There's been scenarios where the motion hasn't been passed, and you know what? The power wasn't cut off. You know, at yeah. nine a.m. this morning. You know, it's not set and forget by any means because there's again go down a whole another rabbit hole here. There's lots of obligations in relation to the Australian Energy Regulator for the owners' corporation as well, given they actually own the embedded network. Let's, I should, let's talk about that topic for a second. You know, many embedded network operators will position it that we own this embedded network, but who owns the electrical infrastructure in a building apart from the meters? The owners' corporation own the like less electricity reticulation. They own the meter panels. They own the main distribution board. And they own all the infrastructure that's in the building except for the electricity meters. It's generally owned by the embedded network operator. So under the, the Australian Energy Regulator's rules and guidelines and framework, whoever physically distributes electrons around a building owns the embedded network, i.e. the owner's corporation. And this is like weird scenarios where the embedded network operator might have you know, taken a lease on, on the infrastructure, something like that. It, it, that it gets into a very complex um, uh, situation, but certainly an anomaly, not the standard. So mm -hmm. there's requirements for the OC to register with the AAR, there's requirements for the owners' corporation to join the ombudsman schemes. Um, certainly, New South Wales and Victoria, that's the case. Queensland, it's a work in progress still, um, even though the, they will get there eventually. That's still a work in progress. So, again, different rules in, in different states. So, there's a lot of obligations for the owners' corporation to enter that they're accepting by accepting the embedded network. And so, they Tell have me to. This. Joseph, if we go to the first AGM, and I actually received an email after I announced you were coming on the show from, I, I believe it was a strata manager who said they had a building that went to a first AGM and said, no, 
we don't want to sign this contract to continue with the embedded network operator. Is it the case then that um, someone's got to go in and install separate electricity meters for each lot and put a whole new system in? I mean, that sounds like a huge task after the building's been completed. Indeed, it's a task. I wouldn't call it specifically a huge task. It's certainly a lot of things to organise. So I guess in that scenario, there's multiple options that that owner's corporation would have either go back to the table with that that embedded network operator and negotiate a better outcome. If they're not happy with what was presented, and frankly, I've seen in some agreements that are 10, 15, 20-year agreements, it's just, I'm sorry, it's a personal opinion. It's just outrageous and you can't have that scenario. So either renegotiate a better outcome or if you can't get to that point, you don't engage that operator, you find an alternative embedded network operator and there will be the scenario where there may be some you know, meters that would need to be replaced or perhaps the new embedded network operator might procure them and you started getting to a really probably an awkward situation with the developer at this point because there was no formal engagement at the first AGM. So therefore the owner's corporation doesn't really have an obligation to embed network operator, their liabilities or obligations would sit between the two original parties, the developer and the embed network operator. So it mm. becomes a, a, a bit of a, a, not even a commercial or a strata discussion, uh, not a commercial discussion, it becomes a legal discussion as well, perhaps around mm. strata rules too, certainly uh, going on the edge of my knowledge of the strata law. So that's where you come in there for that. Yeah. Sort of thing. Yeah, I, I can see why most buildings, especially when you're at motion 36 at a first AGM and it is 9.30 p.m. and you haven't had dinner yet, most buildings say, oh, yeah, that's fine. As long as I have electricity, as long as my lights are on, I'm happy. Um, tell me about that, the practicalities of having an embedded network operator. Does that mean uh, there is no choice for occupiers when they are running their electricity? Yeah, fantastic question, fantastic question because... The answer is, is a, it's a yes and no question at the same time, and both answers are 100% right. So let me talk about the yes side of it first. So, again, I often refer back to the rules and the regulations because uh, it is a rules-driven environment, you know, electricity infrastructure and utility um, services. So you have to refer back to that. I try not to make that too boring and too fundamental, but it is it does live in that sort of territory. So, yes, you can. Yes, you can. So... In shopping centres where there are embedded networks, often 20 or 30% of the tenants successfully engage their own retail of choice and they transfer out. There's no problem. So it's a happening thing. It, it, it works in the market. There's a whole back end of market administration stuff that needs to occur. Um, in many of those scenarios, the shop owner or the, who's running their, their business there will have two energy bills, one from the electricity retailer of choice that's the, the electricity, some renewable charges, which are compulsory, maybe metering, those sort of charges. And the shopping centre owner has a right to charge the customers for the physical distribution charges associated with their energy supply. It's roughly, you know, 50, 50, 60, 40, you know, it sort of depends, you know, in, in that, sort of, that sort of range. So it happens in the market. So there's the yes, the yes answer to the question. But the no part of that answer is it's so difficult to find an electricity hmm. retailer that's actually prepared to make an offer to this customer. So you're talking in a shops that customers might be 20, 30, 40,000 upwards, you know, kilowatt hours per annum. Even 50,000 is still a very small load in the energy market. So, but it's still larger than a residential customer, which might be two, three, or 4,000, you know, kilowatt hours per annum. So the energy retailer's margin associated with a small customer is so small and all their like their automated market interfacing systems are all set up for mass market, you know, where it's all B2B transactions, business to business transactions, and it's all automated. So as yeah. soon as they step sort of one degree left of centre, it just makes it very difficult for them. And frankly, when I started my own business last year and, you know, working out my my focus on, on what I was going to be doing, I thought, oh, I'm bed networks, I'm an expert in that space. There's not many of us that are independent. So I just I rang around to the retailers and said, you know, would you make an offer to residential customers? And and pretty much everybody said no. And wow. so so while in theory, yes, customers certainly can transfer out residential, and it has happened. There might be the odd one here and there who's pursued it with perhaps a non-mainstream type energy retailer that was prepared to you know, go to all that extra effort to make it all happen. It's just really difficult. Pushing water uphill, I suppose, mm. would be a 
question. Yeah, but the market allows that. The market does allow it, Terry. Yeah, I'm just going to flip over to some of the comments here. There's a lot of them. And I think Brent Clark uh, from What Block is here. Hey, Brent. And he's kicking off that discussion about the positives, I think, is how I read Brent's comment. I'm going to show it on the screen at risk of us being disappearing behind it. And gosh, I'm on my laptop today and look at this. I'm showing my age. <laughs> Trying to read what this says. Sometimes embedded network providers will provide the developer with hot water plant, centralized tempering valve system to make sure residents don't scald themselves from the hot water, ultraviolet system to ensure water is cleaned on a reticulation loop, no legionnaires, solar system, EV charging, in addition to all the electricity and hot water meters for zero cost to the developer. Yes, uh, much cheaper. And I suppose um, positive indeed, but is the developer passing on that saving when they're selling their apartments? Did you want to speak a little bit more, Joseph, about, uh, you know, the building that's agreed we're going to continue with the embedded network. We accept it's incredibly difficult to change. So we are here taking what we're given, what we're told to take. Is this a good deal? Are we getting electricity uh, cheaper as residents when we're on an embedded network? Yeah, so that's great. And just to jump back to Brett for a sec, I, I know Brent. We've known each other for many years. So hi, Brent. How are you going? Thank you for the comment. And just to talk to that, yes, if you do have a centralised hot water plan and the embedded network manager is managing that, that scenario is called service hot water. Yeah, that in theory is a, a great outcome for the for the residents, without any doubt. You know, they can reduce their levies for that. It's important to know what hot water tariffs they're being charged, etc., as well, because with hot water in particular, there's no choice at all. There's no market rules allow any customer to procure their hot water services from anybody. Uh, except mm-hmm. embed network manager, embed network right. operator. Yeah, so, so yeah, so um, we can have a, another debate later on, Brent, about that if you want to. But, yeah, there's good and bad, and I'm, I'll talk about solar and other examples too um, down the track. But, yeah, so, so it's good. So is it a good deal or not? You know, maybe that's a good segue into other things. Yeah. So I've seen scenarios, fantastic scenarios, where the owners' corporation's common area energy needs are being sold at below market, you know, 10 15 20% below what they would have been able to get if they were a market customer. So tick, you know, that's fantastic. I've seen scenarios where the residential customers are being also getting, is it the best market price at that minute? Uh, maybe, maybe not, because there's always, you know, different offers going out you know, every day. Every, every retailer will do, do a new offer. But I've seen them where, you know, it can be 15 20% you know, below whatever the default market offer is or in Victoria, Victorian default offer, you know, below those market prices. So that's, again, a fantastic scenario. If you've got the embedded network operator who have invested in solar or electric vehicle charging infrastructure, as, as Brent also mentioned as well, and that solar was paid for by the embedded network operator, that solar is being fed directly into the common area load for the building. So effectively the embedded network, uh, uh, the owners corporation are, are reaping 100% of the benefit of that solar. Tick, fantastic outcome as well. So of course, there are those sort of scenarios where there are fantastic outcomes for for those people. But converse to that, putting aside cost of assets, because it also comes down to individual people as well, not the entity, not just the owners corporation. I've seen scenarios where people's prices, it's barely you know, discount from market prices. It is, it is gouging. It absolutely is. People are being taken advantage of because they don't have an opportunity to really go to market. There are some market rule changes happening. I'm very happy to talk about that in a minute. I've seen scenarios where the owners corporation, at least I reviewed probably 70 or 80 bed network contracts last year, and at least 50% of them, the owners corporation with at least between 20 to 50% overcharged to what they would have been if they were a market customer. And wow. historically, embed networks have been seen as a bit of a black box. People go, ah, oh, it's embedded network. I can't, I can't do anything about it. Well, m- my objective is to purely to educate people. You know, I, I want to ed- educate and advise people. This is how it works. Then you make whatever decision you want. You want mm-hmm. to pursue something? Great. If, if you don't care about electricity, it's just electricity, don't care, great. Yeah, whatever the outcome is, it's up to each individual. But people need to understand what their options are and what their rights are. And what would you say to an owner who is a resident in a building, whether, whether they're an owner-occupier or they're a tenant, and there's an embedded network and they want to find out 
where they sit, whether they're in that 50% that you think there's some gouging going on or whether they're in on the other side where, yeah, it's pretty much market or it's even better. Uh, do they go to their strata manager to start that conversation? If they're a committee member, where do they go to? How do they start getting educated? Yeah, okay. So lo- lots of options out there. So certainly the ombudsman in each jurisdiction would be happy to talk to people. That's why I touched on very early that the owners corporation needs to be a member. They need to join the ombudsman scheme. Otherwise, if you're not a member of the ombudsman scheme, and theoretically the ombudsman has no uh, obligation to talk to that customer. That's why there's some of the rules were changed. So that's certainly one, one starting point. I would go back to the embedded network operator as well. I'm not happy with these tariffs. I've been on the you know, energymadeeasy.com you know, government website. You know, I can get a tariff that's you know, 10% cheaper than what I'm on at the moment. I want you to match that. And then, if and then, you know, that's certainly a scenario there. Absolutely, could go back to the strata manager to ask them to undertake some sort of review, whether they think that the common area rates are reasonable or not. The strata manager may may have knowledge about that, or I guess finally, which is again self serving, but that's what I do. I review embedded network contracts. You know, that's that's part of my business, and I just finished one last week for a site up in, I won't say the suburb, Central Coast, up there, and. The owners corporation were being ripped off X number of dollars per annum, ripped off. It's a very strong expression, but they were. And they had no idea what was going on. The strata manager may or may not have known as well. Again, it's a bit of historically, there's a bit of legacy angst about embedded networks. It's a black box. No one mm. knows about it. So it, it's an embedded network. It is what it is. But mm. it's not. It's not it's not it is what it is. You know, it, people can actually do something about it. Yes, and that is a very important message for people to take away. I'm heading back to the comments and we have a comment here from Patrick who is coming to us from LinkedIn. And we, you spoke earlier, Joseph, about these 10-year contracts that are permitted in Victoria. And Patrick's saying new Victorian legislation is close to being formalised, if not already in play for a maximum three years for the initial term to provide more protections for owners uh, from being locked into poor contracts. Excellent. Good to see that yeah. happening there. From I know Patrick as well. Hi, Patrick. <laughs> All the professionals. Uh, and Savia is asking, does it mean that only the owners corporation can change energy retailers in the embedded network? What about residents? Um, that's a good point. And you, you've kind of answered part of that with the residents, uh, yes, having the option to change. But my understanding is with an embedded network, the owners corporation as an entity, do they have any say in who the operator is? Absolutely. So the, the owners corporation has two relationships with the embedded network operator. One is for the management of the whole site as a a management contract. The second one is supplying energy to the common area load, the common area energy needs, which is a like an electricity supply agreement versus the management contract for the whole site. So in those scenarios, the common area load for the embedded networks is generally a a larger, a large supply point, especially for larger buildings. And in the energy market would sort of classify those customers generally as what we call CNI, so commercial industrial large market customers. So they would be similar analogy to the ones in the shopping centre. Very easy for the common area load to transfer out to another supplier if you don't feel that the embedded network operator is doing a good deal um, for you. That's sort of stuff that I can certainly get involved in as well. So it's, it's just basic energy tendering. Mm. Now that leads me to my other question, Joseph, that I flagged for today in our email this afternoon and uh, perhaps related to embedded networks but sometimes not. I have been contacted by a couple of people now, and I always say um, contacted once, noted, contacted two or three times, I, my ears start to prick up and I start talking about it on the podcast or here on these Friday Lives. I understand that strata managers are signing up their buildings to what I'm going to call energy contracts or utility supply contracts in bulk in order to get what they say is a good deal for the building. Is that this kind of arrangement that you're talking about here where there is some market sway because of the size of a building or a group of buildings and then uh, buildings are going to get a better deal when they sign up in bulk through their strata manager? Yeah, absolutely, yeah. So, yeah, the strata management firms would certainly aggregate their total portfolio of common area loads. So this is not for the parent meter I spoke about from Better Networks. It's for the common area, like the uh, property, um, whether it's an embedded network or a non-embedded network, that would be the, the same thing can occur. So, yeah, so uh, the, again, a little bit market definitions of technical detail. So smaller buildings, 
um, like you might call them walk-ups. I think that's the expression mm-hmm. in Australia. Like, you know, buildings where two or three stories, might be, you know, 10 or 15 or 20 lots in there. The, the, their electricity load would be pretty basic, like most likely no lift or no air conditioning or a lot, not a lot of common power um, being drawn. So their energy load is relatively small. So in the market, they're called SME, like um, uh, SME sites, small, medium enterprise okay. sites, yeah. So, and then the larger ones would be CNI. So you aggregate those two lots of sites within the strata manager's portfolio, which might be hundreds and hundreds of sites, depending on how big the firm is. And yeah, they would go to market in bulk to get a, a bulk deal from um, an energy retailer, absolutely. Mm. Now, the question that was put to me recently by an owner who reached out on email, uh, there's an acknowledgement there that the bulk deal may be a better deal, we're getting a discount. It's not the the discount so much um, that is the concern, of course. It's the process being used by the strata management company to enter their client into what is effectively a contract and maybe a contract Mm. for a period of time. Uh, And the question was put to me as uh, what are the legal obligations, responsibilities of the strata manager? Can they do this without us, the strata building, the body corporate, the owners corporation, the committee, telling them to do it or consenting to them doing it. Mm. And the example that was put to me was uh, the strata manager simply said, this is an opt-out process. I sent you an email letting you know this was happening. You didn't opt out. And so now you're signed up to this three-year contract. Uh, yeah. And as a committee member saying, well, hang on, of course I didn't look at it. It looked like some garbage about energy, electricity, went over my head, wasn't paying attention. Can a strata manager sign us up? to that contract, do they have that authority? Now, mm. I don't expect you to answer that question, Joseph. Uh, that is a, a legal question and, and my um, very general answer is, well, have a look at the terms of your agency agreement and what mm. your strata manager is and isn't authorised to do. Mm. I'm seeing some comments here. If you don't mind, Joseph, I'll just quickly flip over to the comments on this exact point and uh, because we have some helpful insights here from strata managers and owners. Um, Gary is saying bulk buying via the strata management company has been commercially beneficial in our experience. That's good to know. Uh, Sean, who I know is a strata manager, we provide this service with full transparency to the strata committee to advise with an opt-out if they wish. There you go. Thank you, Sean. You might have posted that before I mentioned it. I'd be very interested to know how you say that sits with your agency agreement uh, you're not getting express instructions there to do something. I'm not saying right or wrong. I, I haven't looked into it, but I am getting some contact from concerned owners who are saying we didn't even realise that this was happening. Uh, Gary's making a comment there. Of course, the committee needs to explicitly agree. Hmm, question mark. Uh, Joseph, have you any thoughts on this process uh, yeah. with bulk buying? Yep. It's very interesting. And, and I think it comes down to what you said before, in relation to the management agreement that that particular strata firm has with that owner's corporation. Because certainly from an energy market perspective, for a contract to be entered into, and in particular also if it facilitates the transfer from one electricity retailer to another, explicit informed consent with capital letters, EIC, um, is a market terminology, which is which obviously it's obvious what it means, but it's a market terminology thing as well, is required for to be executed in order to facilitate the contract itself and then any transfers needed. So I would assume then that the electricity details of how that's being managed by the strata firm would be expressed in that strata mm-hmm. management agreement and they perhaps, the owners corporations have given them authority to act on their behalf to execute a, a, an agreement, yep. uh, the multi-site agreement. So, yeah, I would assume so. Mm-hmm. Uh, I guess as long as that box is ticked, somewhere along the line, then governance is covered. Uh, whether that owner's corporation committee member read the email or not, that's obviously a question as well. But look, I've been in the sector for over 20 years and I live in a residential building and I know our strata management firm facilitates that, but I don't even know who the energy supplier is to my building. So, but again, <laughs> my just small you're, you're like the lawyer who never reads a contract and it's put it right and signs it. That's what yeah. we all do. <laughs> yes, indeed. Yeah, but my building's tiny, and I'm sure my power bill's two fifths of nothing, so I haven't spent time on it. So, yes, mm. good. Uh, now, I do want to make sure, Joseph, that our viewers and those who are watching 
on the replay know about a webinar that you are a special guest on. The webinar is being run by the Owners Corporation Network, the OCN, and we will pop a link here in our comment section for people to go and register for that free webinar, also supported by the City of Sydney, which is how you came to my attention, Joseph, chatting to Megan Chatterton at the City of Sydney. Uh, I think it's excellent that you're doing this education for owners. Will you be covering some of this stuff in the webinar and maybe some other things we haven't had a chance to get to? Absolutely, yeah, and in a bit more detail as well, especially about some of the rules and regulations that are being addressed to create more transparency within embedded networks. And the regulators have acknowledged, they realise it's a bit clunky and cumbersome at the moment. So these new rules and regulations that have been proposed, I'll, I'll touch on all those in the, in the webinar. Perfect. Very good to know. And I know you and I have discussed a podcast episode as well to dig a little deeper on these issues. I think for me, the key takeaway is simply being aware that you have an embedded network, what it means, and then what your options are to find out more. I think where to go to find out more. It's not necessarily a cause for concern or a bad thing. Uh, There can be lots of Um, positives that have come from having this in place in your building and a lot of other resources that have been set up earlier on in the development that the developers have been able to put in place that have helped you because they have these arrangements. I'm sort of advocating that people must churn automatically just because you it is what it is like you I understand first you know just just review it and do a health check on the rates Mm. Agreements, you know, make sure you're comfortable and happy with it. You might be on the best deal, you know, best thing since sliced bread. Bang, great, happy. Let's just sit here and, and enjoy the benefits we're getting rather than being uh, and not knowing about it. So, yeah, sorry to jump in. No, no, go for it. Uh, I do want to make sure, Joseph, you let our listeners know where they can get in touch with you. We need to know who, who the go to's are when we have these questions. Uh, website, email address. Yeah, so just jump onto my website. It's www.arenaenergyconsulting.com.au. So I've got all my contact details in there. So just jump onto my website, Arena Energy Consulting. Perfect. We will pop that in the comments here as well. Uh, Excellent. Now, so many people here watching live and watching the replay back, if you believe this information is going to be helpful to your neighbours, to your committee, to your strata manager, please do hit that share button and share it with them. Give us a thumbs up. Give us a little love heart. I can see I think I've got a couple of love hearts there today. Uh, If you've liked what we've had to say, that helps Facebook send this out to all those important places, the more people who understand this crazy world that is strata or at least know where to go to gain more of an understanding helps everybody. Um, thank you, everyone, for your comments here today. I am seeing a few more coming. Greg is saying, looking forward to seeing Joseph's webinar too. Great work by you both. Thank you very uh, much, Greg. Thank you, Greg. <laughs> And thank you so much, Joseph. I'm going to let you go out to your Friday evening and your weekend, and I am going to wrangle this little puppy who is wandering around, wondering when he's going to get his next treat. (laughs) Thank you again, Amanda. Thank you, everybody, for the questions. They were great. Thank you very much. Thanks, everyone. Have a good weekend. Joseph, I have you back here with me today because we had such a fabulous chat on Friday Live over on the Your Strata Property Facebook page a couple of weeks ago. And we are bringing that chat to our loyal listeners here on the podcast. But there's one question that I forgot to ask you when we were chatting live, and that was about retrofitting embedded networks into our existing strata buildings. Have you got some thoughts on that? Is that possible? What should buildings be thinking about, looking out for if they do want to retrofit an embedded network? Great. No, very yeah, happy to answer. And thank you for having me back as well again. Thank you for that. <laughs> Great. So retrofitting is a thing. Um, before we get stuck into the residential side of it, on the shopping centre space and even some commercial buildings, it's been happening for decades. So it's absolutely a thing, but obviously today we'll focus on residential buildings. So to make it happen, I guess the first answer is yes, it can, but there's a number of steps that need to be gone through to make that happen. So the most important thing I think is actually having a very engaged owners corporation committee and understanding the reason why they might want to do that. So before we get it into some of the sort of regulatory steps that are involved, the committee has to say, you know, why, why, what's our objective? And certainly 
having a mindset of creating a bit of a sustainable building you know, through establishing a microgrid, you know, introduction of solar or some sort of sustainable measures as part of that whole retrofitting conversion process. That's certainly a great objective and a driver. Future-proofing the building for, for new uh, infrastructure needs such as electric vehicle charging, that can all be done in conjunction with this whole conversion process. And of course, it comes down to money as well, you know, better energy rates for the occupants in the building and also better energy rates certainly for the owner's corporation or the body corporate themselves, you know, for their own you know, energy needs within the building. So there, they would be some of the drivers as to why they would want to do it. So there's certainly some regulatory requirements that need to go through and that they're divided up into two different sections. So you have the rules and regulations in the the energy side of things. So whether it's the strain energy regulator at the federal level or Victoria has some different rules just for Victoria. So that's the Central Services Commission. There is a requirement that explicit informed consent to do this conversion is required from the occupants to the building. So the occupants are the people living in the building, not necessarily the owners or owner occupiers, it's the, the tenants as well as whoever's living in the building, because it's their relationship with their current energy provider that is going to be disrupted in, in some manner. So you need 85% of the occupants in the building to confirm that that would be okay to do that through this explicit informed consent process. So not an opt-out, it's an opt-in process. That is fascinating because it wouldn't be something that our buildings would be used to doing, our committees, our strata managers getting consent from tenants. That's a really important component of the process. No, absolutely. That's one of the very first points I made was an engaged committee. You need an engaged Mm. committee who's prepared to do this because if you consider Someone coming, we're doing conversion, knocking on people's doors at seven o'clock at night, getting them to sign this electricity thing. Yeah, it's not going to happen. You know, so you actually yeah. need the committee to be engaged to explain to the occupants of the building why this is going to occur. So then once you go through that process to get the approvals in order to proceed from the physical conversion perspective, from the energy markets side of things, you then have, of course, all the strata rules that need to be adhered to as well. And for example, you know, a resolution would need to be passed at a general meeting or at the AGM of the actual owners of the building. So this is now not the occupants, of course, or the tenants, it's the owners. And uh, from memory, the New South Wales laws would be 75%, I think, for um, New South Wales. Uh, it can, might, might vary from state to state. Yes. So you're talking about the special resolution, not more than 25% to vote against the proposal, and that's because we're essentially upgrading the common property. Correct, yeah, no, exactly. So that's there's two sort of regulatory steps that are required. Again, in both scenarios, you need to have the Engaged Owners Corporation Committee to be driving it from that side of the fence. And I guess from a, a commercial perspective, there's a couple options, whether the owner's corporation or the body corporate wanted to manage it themselves and say outsource all the various components of the physical conversion, you know, metering, billing services, all that sort of stuff to be managed by the owner's corporation or body corporate themselves, or you would outsource that to an embedded network operator and they basically manage all those steps in between and, and you negotiate a good deal so you make sure that much of the benefits are going back to the owner's corporation directly or and, and or to the occupants. The minimum numbers are probably be looking around 50 or so lots within an apartment block, maybe a little bit less, um, you know, but mm-hmm. it wouldn't really go much smaller than that because then the, the- To make it worthwhile. Correct, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And is it the case, Joseph, that these embedded network operators, similar to their relationships with developers, which we talked about in our earlier chat, they are prepared to cover the upfront costs of this kind of installation in return for the long-term contract? Absolutely. that They absolutely will. On the upfront costs, but also you know, annual benefits could go back to the owner's corporation as well in the form of you know, energy rebates or perhaps introduction of solar that they would fund and, and that energy would be fed you know, into the common property. So they're getting all mm-hmm. the benefits there. But yes, you would need you would need a, a longish term management agreement and the term would be um, associated with how much investment's going in up, up front. Yeah. Do you have clients, Joseph, or buildings that you're aware of that have successfully retrofitted and are happy with that, have never looked back? And then on the other hand, buildings that have perhaps embarked upon the process or looked at it and then either not proceeded for a reason or 
regretted their decision? Yeah. So in the residential space, it's not a very common thing because of all those steps that I touched mm. on before. And shopping centres, they, I mean, they love it. You know, the shopping centre owners, of course. But on the resi side, I, I can't think of any case studies to tell you. I, I know it's happened and certainly in Victoria. Um, they weren't my clients, but I know there's been some conversions there. I've had yeah. discussions here. And frankly, when I spoke with the City of Sydney and some other councils and uh, city-based councils in relation to this, and embedded network conversions was a, a hot discussion topic. Um, there was sustainability people, so it was all about the, the renewables, et cetera, that could be brought into the building. And again, mm. I reiterated, you just need to have an engaged committee that's prepared to do it. And I suspect in a building that's highly owner-occupied versus tenanted, that would be the yes. target, Yeah. Yeah, for sure. I've certainly seen some of these proposals at the front end where committees have been approached perhaps by an embedded network operator. They get excited about the idea. They get some preliminary advice from somebody like me and they say it's all too hard. (laughs) This is not something that we can really see the benefit of when we think about all the upfront effort that we're going to have to put in personally and they don't really get off the ground. So interesting that you, I think you see that from your side too. Yes, no, absolutely. Again, absolutely need an engaged committee who's prepared to put that effort in. And if if they are prepared to do that, then it would be just a process to go through all the steps. Yep. Excellent. Well, thank you so much, Joseph, for coming back and filling in that gap for us. I'm glad we got to cover that one off. And thank you again for sharing all of your expertise about embedded networks. You're very welcome. And thank you for your time too. Thank you for listening to Your Strata Property, the podcast which consistently delivers to property owners reliable and accurate information about their strata property. You can access all the information below this episode via the show notes at www.yourstrataproperty.com.au. You can also ask questions in the comments section, which Amanda will answer in her upcoming episodes. How can Amanda help you today?